Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy life from our studios here in Pismo Beach, California. <laughs> My name is Mark, and on today's show, Brad Pitt gets some friends, the Netflix empire grows, and Beyonce could be feeling some love, if not tonight, very, very soon. Ashley who's joining me today. Also, you're Ken Nassock. I am a native son of Pismo Beach, California, and thank you for the <laughs> shout-out, Mark. Also, my hair is brought to you by Schnepp Hairstyles. <laughs> <laughs> also, here is T. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is T. And actually, according to how she spells it, it's pronounced Beyoncé. Beyoncé. <laughs> I was here at Christian Harlop. I might not take your phone calls ever, but I'll wear your shirt if it's free. <laughs> <laughs> Are you making Beyoncé more French because you just got back from New Orleans? Maybe, but mm. she's also from Louisiana. Yeah. And she's got that accent on the E, so, you know, I like to hit that. Apologies to all of Beyonce's <laughs> friends. Let's get to the circle of life here. Ash, what's up first in the world of movie news? Two big casting announcements happened yesterday for Disney's live action adaptation of The Lion King. First, we learned from THR that Alfre Woodard has joined the cast as Sarabi, Simba's mother, and completing the cast playing the family that includes Don Glover as Simba and James Earl Jones as Mufasa. The rap then broke news that Captain America Civil War actor John Canny has snagged the role of Rafiki, the baboon who served as the royal advisor to Mufasa. The two actors are now a part of the ensemble that includes Seth Rogen as Pumbaa, Billy Eichner as Timon, and John Oliver as Zazu, with the recent addition of Chewie Tell Ejio 4 as the villain Scar. Beyonce is rumored to be playing Simba's love interest, Nala, and is said to be nearing a deal to voice the part while also producing the soundtrack for the film, in which she will also write and perform <clears throat> new songs for the adaptation. Mark, thoughts on the new additions to the cast and the possibility of Beyonce writing <laughs> new songs for the movie. Uh, I'm loving the way this cast is shaping up. I mean, you talk about a Lion King and how are you going to bring it into the, the new generation? How are we going to reintroduce everybody to what we all love from the 1994 animated version? And this cast is just coming together so well. I mean, the big story here is what could be happening, not what's already transpired, that we could be having Beyonce be <laughs> in the movie. And then also, I think that, like, like, Ken, from some of the things we're hearing is that it's not necessarily her deal playing Nala is that that's pretty much a done thing. It's that she could be doing the soundtrack and maybe reprising some of those classic Elton John songs that we know. So hearing her do something like the Circle of Life or the better song, Can You Feel the Love Tonight? I think that's a pretty <laughs> intriguing premise for the new Lion King. It's uh, looking like it's going to be a, kind of a big hit. If Beyonce wants to do anything for you, you say yes. <laughs> and you say how much and when. Uh, absolutely, this is a win. And uh, Alfre Woodard is a win if she wants to join. And John uh, Caney, uh, Caney, Caney? I thought it was Connie. Connie? Yeah. I Connie? I'm not familiar with his John words. Like the popular Someone 90s jeans right. brand? Yeah. Other yeah. than in a crowded Civil War, and I like Civil War, but in a crowded Civil War cast, I go, oh yeah, I remember that dude. Because he stood up, stood out, It's a, mm -hmm. it, it passed the story to Black Panther in a great way. So you're, you're adding some big wins here, and that's what Favreau's got to be very happy. He's like, a, he's like the Yankees in the, in, the, in the 70s, just grabbing all the pl players he wants. That's right. It was funny because we got to see like some exclusive footage at D23 that is like the opening, one of the opening moments of the new Lion King, Christian. And you see that happen, and we don't even know who's doing all the voices here. You don't get to see them talk a lot. Hearing these names paired with these animals is pretty exciting. No, but you remember right after we got done watching it, my first question was, who's playing Rafiki? He's my favorite <laughs> character. It's my favorite character, and when I heard that it was John, I'm going to say Kanai, and I'm probably wrong, and everybody can tell me that, but I think that he, when you, th you think of everything you said, Ken, 100% correct, yeah. he stood out, but it's also the voice. That's what you got to be listening to, and when you just think about the conversations he had with Chad Chadwick Boseman, and you hear those conversations, like, oh yeah. And because as long as he's got the humor, and I guarantee he does because Rafiki had the most humor out of all of them, um, I think that he's a perfect fit for it. As far as Beyonce, yeah, we said this already. She, like, Nala is pretty much a, a done deal, and you would assume that if you're talking to her, and because music is so associated with The Lion King, then yeah, you get it. Because I don't think this is one of those things where it's just a commercial play. It certainly has something to do with it, as it should, mm -hmm. but it's not going to overshadow it. Sometimes they put music in there or artists in there that it's just like just to sell it. But there's other times when they bring an artist like Beyonce to where it fits what they're trying to do. And when you hear what John Favreau does and the vision that he has, 
he's not going to just make a commercial. He's going to make everything that fits because this dude is doing it right. I love everything. Alfie Woodard, everyone so far. And I didn't know, you guys probably covered this, I wasn't on the show, but I didn't know about Billy Eichner and, um, and Seth Rogen. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, that those two together, that is great. I'm loving what I'm hearing so far, so I can't wait to see this movie. Yeah, T, what are your overall thoughts on the Lion King cast so far, and then the rumors that Beyonce might be joining? Well, I think it's uh, pretty much a given that I'm a huge Beyonce fan. I saw her twice on her last tour. I went on vacation and saw her in two different cities. So anything with Beyonce, I'm on board, and I think it'll be interesting to see her to see her return to film because. Earlier in sort of mid stage of her career, she was doing a lot of movies and sort of a lot of questionable choices in there, like the Austin Powers movie and just some weird ones in there. And then she did Dreamgirls, which was sort of uh, solidifying her as an actress as well, you know, the true triple threat. Um, and then she took a backseat and went back to music. So I'm excited to see her returning to film with this project. As far as Alfre Woodard and the rest of the cast, I, I mean, everyone they've picked sounds perfect for the roles they're choosing. It's it's seeming like strokes of genius at one after another. So I don't know. I was skeptical about this idea of a live action Lion King, but based on the cast they're rounding out, I think it's actually got a lot of promise. Wait till you see the opening scene. It's yeah. crazy. I mean, did you just think the, the Jungle Book look good? Yeah. It's times 10. Oh, wow. it, it's so good. It's pretty, like, and you get emotional watching it too, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, like you, ab- you see little baby Simba, then like he furs his nose <laughs> yeah. a little bit. God, it's so good. And that's like, the movie's still like two or three years away, but I mm-hmm. cannot wait to see the rest of it. And judging from this cast, I think it's something to get jacked about. Ashley Mova, got to throw it over to you. Beyonce, possibly in The Lion King. What oh, does yeah. this do to your anticipation level? I mean, come on. Beyonce, Queen Bee, she can do no wrong in my book. I mean, she's amazing. And I, um, even if I had some hesitation, just because I'm not sure how I feel about Beyonce as an actress, um, her doing a voiceover and, you know, she's an amazing singer and seeing the rest of this cast, how it's rounded out. Donald Glover, honestly, this guy, he's like a jack of all trades. He's so talented in music as well. And, um, yeah, I'm just really excited to see how this cast is rounding out. And I mean, Beyonce in my book, she's she's amazing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that Can You Feel the Love Tonight is the best song from The Lion King. Does anybody want to challenge that? Yes. That's on camera, <laughs> Riley? Yeah. Anybody? I don't care. I'll wait until it yeah, comes out. Yeah, I'm pretty ambivalent, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. Well, what a fun spirited debate that was. I like was. the Hans Zimmer the score. How about that? Life. The Circle of Life. Is yeah. that the same song? No, it's, no, it's, it's okay. No. It's Hans Zimmer score. I'm going with that. How about that? The right. Circle, the circle of, life of Life is the life B side. Is classical. Yeah. Can you feel the love tonight? Oh my That's gosh. That's what we're sticking with. I think Hans Zimmer will play that this Friday in concert when I see him. Oh yeah. You're seeing Hans Zimmer? That's right. Wow. Yeah. Look at that. All right. <laughs> All right. Next story. <laughs> Yesterday, Netflix <laughs> announced that the streaming giant made their first acquisition in the company's history by pur- purchasing Millar World, the company founded by Mark Millar, who is the legendary creator of such iconic characters and stories as Kick-Ass, Kingsman, and Old Man Logan. The company will now turn their eye to developing franchises through film, series, and kids shows that will only be available on Netflix. Since Millar World was started, the company and its co-creators have published 18 character worlds, of which three, Wanted, Kick-Ass, and Kingsman, have yielded theatrical films that together have grossed nearly $1 billion in global box office. No word yet on which property will be developed first. Ken, what do you think about Netflix's acquisition of Millar World? I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. He's the Stan Lee of our generation. I'm still going to scroll through things for 35 minutes and then watch a season two episode of Cheers. <laughs> what, what won't you say, coach? All right. Um, look, but uh, this is great. I, I do mean that, the Stan Lee of our generation. So uh, he's got a lot of properties, a lot. It's one of those things that, like, I love I loved Kick-Ass, the first one. Uh, I, I'd love to see a, a grown-up take on Hit Girl. I'd love to, this, this is that possibility. Um, he, he, the man, this is the man behind Old Man Logan, which turned into one of my favorite superhero movies. So uh kingsman too by the way which was you know created to let's create a comic first sell it back to ourselves and make it into it that's how you do it too so there's a lot of uh creativity behind this and it's also um comics for like a a, a more modern new generation you know does that make sense it's 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 that's that's why he is the stanley of our time and and all on board and netflix how could you be bankrupt 
This is probably why. You're spending this much money to get good things. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it was weird hearing that story come out last week that Netflix is like $20 billion or something in the hole. But when you when you get to that level, it's it's, it's a billion here or there. You acquire a company, make some projects. It's all going to be fine when the books are done this December or April, whenever they do their books. But look, when you look at Mark Millar, he's responsible not just for his own properties with Millar World, but also helping shepherd some of the storylines, whether it's Avengers or Civil War. So this guy clearly has his fingers on the pulse of what comes comic book fans want by and large. And so if you have Netflix making this acquisition from his own mouth and his own company statement, they, they referenced that Warner Brothers acquired DC in the late 60s. And then you had Disney acquiring Marvel in the 2000s. And then this is the next logical step. So the Netflix empire grows. And I think that the big question here, T, is what project do you think Netflix is going to want to kick off this new partnership with? Is it going to be something that is in a world that we already know, whether it's Kick-Ass or it's Kingsman or it's even Wanted, or do you think they go with something more original that we haven't seen yet? I think it behooves them to do uh, to start off with something that's a bit more of a pre-sold franchise because they're in the hole, as we've covered, so I think they would want something that's got immediate brand recognition. Having said that, I wouldn't. I would personally love to see them kind of do a do-over on Wanted, maybe serialize it, turn it into a series, something like that, because I think that movie had great bones and it wasn't the best execution. It was just ever so slightly shitty, maybe even moderately <laughs> shitty. And I feel like if we got to do that again, it could be done very, very well because it's got great ideas and concepts in it. So that would be my pick, and I think they would be smart to start off with something that we already kind of know and love. Christian, your take, Netflix getting the lower world. I am 100% on board with T's suggestion. I think that one, it would be a great serialized um, thing for them to do, and you can really explore what that whole world is about. And I think that was one of the problems with that movie was that it was all rushed, and it was all the explanation was like, oh, it's very similar to what just happened with The Dark Tower. It's like you have this extensive world that you just flop onto the screen for an hour and a half or two hours, and it's like there's so much more. Give me more, give me more. And that's the benefit that we have now with Netflix and Amazon and all these things. So I would like to see that explored. I think that it's a smart move for Netflix to acquire um, Millar World and, and, and see what we can do with it. Because I feel a guy like that and these properties, um, th it goes back to the point I made yesterday with what you can do now with Netflix and Amazon and how it's just changed. Stories like this need to be explored further. It is almost a disservice sometimes to just put them on for two hours. So I think this is a good move for him. And I think this is what a lot of people now, a lot of artists have these opportunities now, guys like Mark, Mark Millar, to go to Netflix, to go to Amazon and say, I want my stories explored the way that I intended them to be what can we do? And I think that this is showing what they can do. Yeah, you know, it's interesting if you think about uh, which property should they explore first in the world of Mark Millar is that, like, you you want to go to, oh, yeah, something that's already have a proven track record. And you could certainly do that, even if you took, like, Kingsman source material and you made it where the movies are very cinematic and it's like an end-of-the-world feel. If you had a Netflix series that had something in the Kingsman universe where it was akin to what Marvel does on Netflix, where Luke Cage and Daredevil, they're superheroes, but they're really taking care of their streets and their block as opposed to fighting you know demons from another dimension but you also have a lot of original stuff you could pull from there's a really cool book called the heist which has like a a baby driver super villain kind of feel to it that i think you can do a lot of cool stuff with so mark millar congratulations on netflix buying you hopefully they're no longer bankrupt all right let's go on to our next story oh this is opening this week well this will be fun do we have any possessed dolls to talk about <laughs> that we do it's annabelle creation former toy maker sam Mull and his wife Esther are happy to welcome a nun and six orphan girls into their California farmhouse. Years earlier, the couple lost their seven-year-old daughter Annabelle in a tragic car accident. Terror soon strikes when one of the girls finds a seemingly innocent doll and that seems to have a life of its own. All right, I'm going to stop you right there, Ashley. In no world do I ever allow a nun and six weirdo <laughs> kids to come into my farmhouse. That is a recipe for disaster. I grew up going to Catholic school. I really am afraid of nuns and I'm terrified of children so I would not go anywhere near this and this is probably why you end up with a possessed doll on your hands. T, is Annabelle Creation something that you are putting on your calendar as must see in theaters this weekend? Absolutely not. I watched the trailer <laughs> and it was like the most paint by numbers basic bitch horror movie trailer I've ever seen. I was just like okay and here comes the jump scare in three, two, like it was ridiculous. It's ever every horror movie trope 
thrown into another movie that we don't need to see because we've seen it before. All right, well, I'm going to be positive here and get excited about Annabelle Creation <laughs> from the standpoint of I believe in the director, David Sandberg. I think he can put some good scares in there. I don't mind a good jump scare every now and again. Christian, I know you might be more on T's page than mine. We're seeing it tomorrow. Your thoughts? Oh, I can't wait to see this movie. That sounded sincere. No, it's not <laughs> sincere at all. I don't care about this movie. I'm going to see it, but I, it's also because I want to I want to see what's coming out this weekend. I like to see if, if I can catch the movies. Contrary to people's belief it's so that I'm avoiding horror movies, I yeah. just get lucky. <laughs> I get lucky sometimes. Them, huh? I get lucky sometimes that there, I have other things to do sometimes and that are more important when the horror movies hit. However, this Wednesday is not one of them. I'm going to be seeing that movie, and um, I don't want to. I just, I don't, I agree with you. I think that it looks like every single thing, it's, it's, it looks like what I hate about horror movies. Now, what I will also say is one of the reasons I don't like horror films normally is because of the things that we just see over and over and over again. But when you get something like The Conjuring, or Conjuring 2, something with a little bit more depth in it, um, I like those movies because I think that there's more to them. It's not just, it, it's not just shit to be as intelligent as I can. Um, shit. And I, uh, I, this one looks like Shit. Ken, we got two potty mouth Brady cats on the panel. Are you joining their ranks? Are you coming with me to see Annabelle Creation waving a big Annabelle pennant? Look, uh -huh. you know me. I'm one of the most basic bitches around. And I will tell you that this, I just, I'm scared at the poster. You know I get scared at this shit. I can't do it. Who brings dolls home like that? They look, come on. No. I, I hope it's bad, but I'm not getting past that poster. If you I don't could, like scary movies. I'm going to give you a doll, right? And you have to no! keep this thing in your room. And I'm it done. can either be Annabelle or it can be Chucky. Which one you take? Ooh. I'm moving. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to take one with you. And you got to put or JTE doll. That's the scariest one at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No. no. Yeah. No, I mean, and people get mad at me that I, I'm, I'm wiping away an entire genre as a movie. I'm sorry. I don't like to be scared. Yeah, For but this record, could be though, like a... I must say, I do enjoy horror movies. I just yeah. am tired of ones that don't have original concepts. And I really liked, what was it, Lights Out? Oh, yeah. That was a Same good Same director, yeah. Yeah, I so. know. So I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, this is because Lights Out was like, like David Sandberg made Lights Out and it was just like this little YouTube short that entered some film festivals and almost won. It became this huge sensation. Then James Wan liked it, they made it. And so now I look at this as kind of like a test for David Sandberg. Like if you can make a sequel to Annabelle and you can make it have a solid story and give us some good scares, imagine what else this guy would be able to do. Ashley, I know you're a big horror fan, so please get on board with Annabelle Creation. Oh yeah, I'm so on board for this and I feel like almost embarrassed that you guys hate it so much so it makes me feel like awkward that I'm really excited for it because the last Annabelle love I saw Love what you love, Ashley love I'm, what I'm you just love. gonna stand on my own and say that I'm really excited to see it um, because I love Conjuring so much I was really excited to see the last Annabelle and that that was shit so I'm really excited <laughs> that this one looks so much better and um Sandberg, like I was so I saw his lights out short back in 2014 or 2000. 13 or something like that and they posted on Twitter and it's really excited to, exciting to see his kind of career come full circle in a sense and this just looks super juicy and scary I'm excited I love juice and I love scariness <laughs> maybe I love possessed dolls as well let's move on to buy or sell this is a part of the show where Ashley the film fan Ashley is going to give us a premise we'll simply say whether we buy it or sell it and try not to scare Ken in the process boo THR is reporting that Oscar-nominated actress Ruth Naga has signed on to star alongside Brad Pitt in the sci-fi epic Ad Astra, directed by James Gray. The movie is described as an adventure film about one man's journey across a lawless and unforgiving solar system to find his missing father, a renegade scientist who poses a threat to all of mankind. Naga's role is being kept under wraps at the moment, but in THR's report, the trade also revealed that Tommy Lee Jones is also attached to the project in an unknown role. There is Still no release date set at this time. T, buy or sell Ruth Naga and Tommy Lee Jones joining Brad Pitt in Ad Astra. You know, I'm going to buy that. Although I think it's pretty clear that Ruth Nega is going to be playing the father and Tommy Lee Jones will probably be a love interest. <laughs> um, I'm on board for this. I think, um, you know, the cast sounds great. I feel like Brad Pitt and his production company have pretty much been on a roll with their last few projects. I really enjoyed The Big Short and obviously 12 Years a Slave was an Oscar darling. So 
I'm excited to see what they do next, and I'm excited to see what actually happens with this casting, since they're being so cryptic about it. Perhaps they aren't going to play into my expectations. That's right. It's so secretive. Maybe it is going to go off the beaten path, but if you, you give me a Ruth Nega and you say Tommy Lee Jones are going to be joining this cast, I'm totally on board for it. It's a big buy for me. And also because James Gray directed The Lost City of Z, which I just caught on a plane coming back from Charlotte, and uh, it's really good. It's like a really entertaining story, and it's that big sweeping tale. You also have some nice emotional moments. But Christian, I'm going to tell you this premise again. Okay. Tell me if this sounds familiar. Sure. The movie's an adventure film about one person's journey across an unforgiving solar system to find a missing renegade scientist father who may be the key to destroying the galaxy. Spaceballs. I was thinking Rogue One. Oh, I like it. Okay. Um, listen, I am always buying new sci-fi. I always want to try to see with that hope that there's going to be some brand new sci-fi that doesn't just rely on old franchises, even though I like old franchises, obviously, but I think that this is something with this kind of cast uh, I, I like so far. I agree that I don't know enough about it yet, but I like who's involved. So I'm optimistic and can't wait for the trailer. Ken Knapsack, do you think that Ruth Nega can take a break from her rutabaga business mm. and get in? I have something to say. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Guys, listen, uh, it's a small business right now, but Ruth Nega and myself are joining in to actually create the first all-celebrity Ruth Nega's Rutabagas. It's organic Rutabagas, what, uh, what most people would call a turnip, but it's an actual Rutabaga. It's, it's going to be the sole sponsor of this new Brad Pitt movie, so when you get to theaters, you're thinking sci-fi, and what says sci-fi more than Rutabagas? What's Thanks, a Rutabaga? Sure. Well, you know what's funny about that? You know, you know what's Ham's funny about that, him. Mova? Is that when he asked, he literally asked Ruth Nega, that question at Comic Con, you can find that on the channel. She had no idea and didn't want anything to do with him. Yeah, it's going to be an uphill battle for Josh McCuga <laughs> to convince Ruth about this new business venture. Ken, business ventures aside, do you think that this is a. Hold on, I'm, I'm still having a sexual. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, it's nice to see that Tommy Lee Jones is getting happier in his old age. It's. Uh, <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm not sure what happened, but, but uh, yeah, that's also that was the writer's room for two months. Guys, I got a great idea about rutabagas and Ruth Nega. Um, so I, I, I'll buy this. I'll buy this based because Christian just convinced me to buy it. Uh, I like the idea. We, we complain about tentpole filmmaking. We complain about properties from our childhoods being ruined forever. Um, give me something original, somewhat original. I think I've heard scientists missing in space before, not just with, with Rogue One, but this kind of crap. Uh, cast and you mentioned Lost in Z. I haven't seen it, but this is how I this is my movie career. I'm like I'd consider seeing that, <laughs> and that's how much I was interested. You'll never uh, see it, but as long as it's in your it's, docket, it's right, right, right? There's a lot of cheers to watch, buddy. Right, right? A lot of episodes ahead there. Um, so yeah, uh, and Ruth Negga's got she's got one of those rising stars. Like you're hearing mm -hmm. her name more and more, not just the Josh McCougar's bad jokes. It, it, it's one of those uh, <laughs> rising stars, and and you mix a rising star with an old crusty ass like Tommy Lee Jones. I mean, come on. You got This is good. Well, yesterday we had crusty eye. Today we have crusty asses. And Tommy Lee Jones, you're at the front of the line. Ask your questions and move on. <laughs> Let's move on to our next buyer sell. THR reports that Becca Thomas has been tapped to direct Malignant, a sci-fi action thriller that James Wan is producing for 20th Century Fox. Malignant is based on a Boom Studios comic titled Malignant Man that Wan co-created with, with a story focusing on Alex Gates, a patient dying of cancer until it's discovered that his malignant tumor is actually a mysterious alien parasite. With incredible powers and a renewed purpose, Gates is tasked with fighting a secret army lurking behind the veils of society. Becca Thomas is one of only two people outside the Duffer Brothers and Sean Levy to direct an episode of Netflix's Stranger Things, the other being Wally director Andrew Stanton. A release date has not been secured. Christian Barcel, Becca Thomas directing Malignant for Fox. I'm going to sound like uh, you know a record once again. It's, it is, uh, it's a buy for me because even though it's based off a comic book, it's not a well-known comic book. But it's new. It's brand new, and I, I like... I mean, I'm assuming... Uh, there wasn't an episode of Stranger Things that I didn't like, and I assume I liked hers. I don't know which one she did. She's doing season, season two. two. No, oh, you she haven't, you haven't seen it yet. Ah, I haven't seen it yet. Okay, all right. Well, that's what I get for having uh, things in my ears. Um, but I, uh, I, I... She did something to get the job, but either way, I want to see what this is going to entail. I like the idea of having like this alien bug is, is the reason why he gets these powers. It's a brand new way. It reminds me kind of similar to what Chronicle did. And now it doesn't mean it's going to be directed in that style, but it's new, it's fresh. So let's see. And once again, 
Let's see what the trailer looks like. Yeah, I'm going to buy it, too. I'm excited to see what Becca Thomas can do. She's also attached to direct that Little Mermaid movie, not the right. Disney one, the uh, the other one. That, uh, it's so going to be like Coppola was supposed to be on that. Raw first, right? and gritty yeah. and like based on Hans Christian Andersen, like Murpho yep, just yep, beating yep. the crap out of each other. It's going to be really interesting. But this one, I just love this premise so much where you think it's a tumor, which is really bad, and it turns out to be an alien parasite, which is like, is that better? Is yeah. that actually, <laughs> like if you were at the doctor and they're like, hey, we thought it was a tumor. Good news, it's not. Bad news, it's an alien inside you. I would vote for alien because I want to see what happens. I want to see what happens with this movie. T, you're on board with this alien tumor movie. I'm going to buy it too. Um, the premise to me reminds me a little bit of the brain slugs in Futurama, but with like a Batman <laughs> Begins kind of grittiness. So I'm interested. I'm intrigued. And uh, I'm not familiar with this directress because I have not seen her episode of Stranger Things yet. So I'm curious to see how this turns out. And uh, yeah. I like I like what they're telling I like what they're saying and I like how they're saying it to me. And do you know why you haven't seen her episode of Stranger Things yet? Because it's season two. Because it's not yet out. Ken Knapsack. Prove it. Mm. Becca Thomas. This comes out the Halloween. Your thoughts. This is an interesting remake of Travolta's phenomenon. Like <laughs> this is a good take on it. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, I buy it. I buy it because I like I like new talent getting uh, you know the chance to put their voices out there, and, yeah. and and she hasn't done. I'm looking at her IMD. So funny. I've been in town 19 years. I'm like, have I met her somewhere? Like, I, I, it's one of those moments. She's uh, got one of those faces. Yeah, can, yeah, exactly. I'm sure I have it. Something um, weird, Ken. What? What? What's going on over Sorry. there? Uh, <laughs> get stuff out of your ears. Um, yeah, I mean, she's. Uh, I like that you you find someone with talent who's not had the chance to do big things yet, and you give them you give them that chance. And, and I'm looking at what she's done before. The fact that this Little Mermaid, not a Disney one, but that that's uh, that's still a big film. And Stranger Things is it's the hottest thing around. So let's do it. Let's buy it. Let's see what this alien parasite brain tumor is gonna do. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of what James Wan is doing right now with, with producing films and giving directors you may not have heard of a chance to do great things. It certainly worked with David Sandberg and Lights Out. Hopefully it works for Becca Thomas with Malignant. Now we are going to move on and remind you guys that at the end of this show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. And Movie Talk is not the only show that you can catch right here on Collider Video's YouTube channel. We also have a show, a controversially named, but I got it this time time thrones talk ladies and gentlemen it's about that popular hbo program ballers ken tell us about it actually we just rate and review bathrooms um <laughs> it's you've got Who's it completely wrong <laughs> yeah exactly thrones How's Tommy Lee jones bathroom yeah, it's grumpy um <laughs> yeah that's what we do we had a big episode this week i would have named the show casterly talk but i didn't have that decision casterly so, talk's a pretty but good it's a, one it's a it's a niche it's, deep it's, cut. A, it's a deep cut. Yeah. It's a, you got to go for the general yeah, public. Kind of like open the blast dragons. doors. But anyways. Hey. Something hey. like that. I still like that title. Make sure you guys check out Thrones Talk. It was a huge episode of Game of Thrones on Sunday, and they covered everything it dropped yesterday. TV Talking Heroes is every weekday. You guys are going to get TV Talk live at 11 a.m. Provided we're done in time, which we might not be. Then also an all-new Heroes later on today. There's also new comic book shopping with John Schnepp. It's a really fun series you guys can check out right here. Plus, the movie. Movie trivia schmodown. It keeps rolling along, and we have a new inner geekdom match dropping today between Jay Washington and Robert Meyer Burnett. Is there any hope for Washington, Christian? Uh, it's going to be tough. Burnett is on the warpath now that he's joined the Lions Den, and it's big. Whoever wins this is going to be in the triple threat match. Uh, it's going to be a, a tough match for Washington, but we'll see what happens. And of course, Awesome Tack, yours every Friday. You can check it out on Go90. The latest episode's link is in this vid's description. Check out all the frivolity with our good buddy Jeremy Johns. Now we move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where we get to hear from you guys. You guys can always eat Email us anytime, day or night. I will read them. Collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll either answer it on Movie Talk or on our weekend show's mailbag, and we answer one right now. Joseph writes, hey, everybody. DC has gotten a lot of scuff in the past for being too reactionary. Now that everyone has fallen in love with Wonder Woman movie, it seems she is being thrown into the front of everything, from Justice League to now Flash. Do you think DC is putting itself back in a troubling position with being reactionary? Also, do you think too much Wonder Woman is a possibility? Thank you for taking my question. I would not be worried about too much Wonder Woman in the DCU right now. I mean, I, I think about other comic book characters that I really enjoy in other worlds, and I don't think we ever had too much Wolverine 
in X-Men movies. I don't think we ever have seen too much Iron Man in Marvel movies. And I thought that was a fear of Spider-Man Homecoming is, wait, is this just an Iron Man movie? I love Tony Stark in Spider-Man Homecoming. I thought he added something actual that was like important to the film and not just, oh, hey, I'm in this movie, so come see it. I think that's what the DCU is going to be doing with Wonder Woman going forward. Whatever the next time we see her is, Justice League, and then we'll have a new Wonder Woman standalone, Flashpoint. All of these sound like great ideas to me because, Christian, when you see not just the marketing material for Justice League that they're putting Wonder Woman front and center, it's also, it seems like her and Bruce Wayne are on the same page as far as being the leaders on this recruiting mission to get the best superheroes in the world to fight this evil. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to address the actual email. It's a great email because it is a, it is a valid question. Um, but what I've seen so far from Warner Brothers actually makes me think that they're doing this absolutely right. I think that they have been using her in the way that you have to. I said it yesterday on the show, Wonder Woman right now is the hot ticket, meaning she's the one that's really driving the story. She's the one that is now shaping the DCEU in the way that you wanted it to go because the big complaints beforehand were that it was too dark, there was no hope, and yada yada. Um, Batman's always going to be the biggest and most popular character. There's, there's never going to be a, an argument with that, and Superman is right behind him. However, right now, they are the ones, Superman, for story reasons, not really around. Batman, we don't know what the hell's going on with him, but we know that Wonder Woman is intact. Wonder Woman is the strong lead, so you lead with her. That's what you should do. You should lead, put her in, if, and she's also driving the story. As long as, as long as I'm not sitting in the theater going, they're just using her to just, to just show up. And I don't feel I'm going to do that. But until I feel that, I think this is the right move by Warner Brothers, the way that they're doing it. But you also got to, like you said, with, with, with the way you pepper in Iron Man, you've got to do it right. Don't just overexpose. And right now, I think it's the way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with Superman, I think Wonder Woman has left Superman, at least in my mind, as far as like the second superhero. Of all and, time, I think yeah. the body of work, though. I think body of work still, I think Superman has too many movies in his back pocket with Superman 1 and 2, the Donner versions, the Christopher Reeve stuff. There's, there's too much history right now with, with Superman on screen to let one really good movie bypass uh, but Wonder Woman. But it's also the, where, where the culture seems to be heading is that I think people are more excited to see new Wonder Woman movies than new Superman movies. Maybe so, but I, I, it still doesn't... Like I said, I think it's Batman, Legacy, Superman, sure. and yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Overall, right now, I'm, I just said Wonder Woman should be the lead. Right now, yeah. she's the most popular out of the three of them. Um, but I think that overall, that's, that's your top three. See, how much Wonder Woman are we getting these days? Too much, too little, just right. Um, I think that they're probably doing what they should be doing in terms of, you know, the desire for Wonder Woman, the reaction to the film. I thought that was a really great great question because it got me to thinking about this whole issue of DC overcorrecting in a way uh, because they are reactionary, but so is Marvel. And I feel like mm -hmm. they don't get in trouble for being reactionary because they're better at it. Uh, they have, they've had more successful movies that people like better, but they're doing the same thing by peppering in Iron Man into Spider-Man, you know, all these types of things kind of like uh, doing the same things that DC is doing, but doing them more successfully. So it's not really that DC is too reactionary. They just need to be better at it. Yeah, Ken, it's an interesting point T brings up is that the best way to course correct something is to not let anybody know that you're course correcting yeah. something. Are we on the right path here with Wonder Woman? Yeah, T's point is very insightful. Marvel's probably done some of the same things, but because we as a public or as a moving of a public are like, hey, Marvel's great. DC is under some kind of weird microscope mm -hmm. that we might put them under. Uh, it's, it's like, an NFL team, Mark, uh, sports reference of, uh, you know, a crazy offensive play. And now everyone in the NFL is like just wedging it in, you the know, wildcat. second down, wildcat, wildcat. <laughs> this is Wonder Woman. This isn't agent, uh, agent, uh, you know, nobody that we're like, oh, some fans like it. this is Wonder Woman. Uh, this <laughs> just in Flashpoint, too. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, this, yeah. This, this just in a lot of people like that movie. So DC has a right to be like, oh, we're not wedging her in, as Christian said. Great point. We are following her lead. And that is. If that's reactionary, that's a good reaction. That's right. I'm excited to follow her lead march into Justice League this fall. And now we're going to march into live Twitter questions. Thanks to our good friend Wendy Lee Zaney has been monitoring the chat room, or at least the Twitterverse. Wendy, how's Twitter looking today? Oh, it's looking great. Got a lot of questions lined up for you guys. First one comes from Debbie, who writes, Has anyone seen Wind River? And if you have thoughts, and if not, do you want to see it? Uh, okay, so here's the breaking news. I've not seen Wind River, but, but, but our buddy Ace on the Schmoes No Live show has seen Wind River, and he's going to be talking about it tomorrow night on the show. Anybody else want to chime in? I have seen Wind River. Ooh. I saw it at Sundance. 
<laughs> uh, and the director, writer, Taylor Sheridan, he did a talk afterward. He was really, really cool, very chill guy. Now, this is the same guy who wrote Sicario as well as Hell or High Water, and this is his directorial debut. This was my favorite movie of Sundance. Wow. Uh, he said he never wants to direct again, which is probably because he directed a film in Wyoming in the winter uh, that is mostly outdoors. But uh, I, I hope he does direct again because I'm really excited to see more from this guy. I already knew he was an amazing storyteller just based on the previous two films that I knew he'd, he had written. But as a director, I mean, this film was done very well. And I love movies that are kind of smaller, more story-driven, character-based, not necessarily tentpole films. So as a hipster douchebag, it was right up my alley. And it Ken, as somebody who is not what you would call a hipster douchebag, but somebody who did work in law enforcement for a long time, crimes are harder to solve when they're committed in the snow. Can I just f follow T around the world? Just, just, <laughs> she was in New Orleans last week. Yeah. That's why I that. sound like this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. No, this, uh, I'm just looking at, the, at this real quick. This seems like something, uh, nothing harder to track than the truth. That's a tagline, kids. Uh, no, this is good. This is good. Love it. Love Christian. it. You would be a hipster douchebag too, and loving Wind River. Uh, I see. I I, I take. I don't think that uh, T is a hipster douchebag. I think she. Uh, <laughs> but I, I listened to. I love the, both those movies that he wrote. And so when I heard about this movie, I was like, yes, please, I want to see it. I have not seen it. I was looking forward to Ace's um, review of it. I know T, and I respect her film opinion. So I'm going to absolutely. I wanted to see it. I want to see it even more now. All right. Some of us are hipsters. Some of us are douchebags. Some of us combine the whole thing into one giant package. But not you, Wendy. <laughs> All right, this next one comes from Alex Williams. Caught me off guard there. Um, what are the chances of Tiffany Haddish, uh, if I'm saying her last name correctly, mm -hmm. can get an Oscar nomination for Girls Trip if Melissa McCarthy got one for Bridesmaids? Hmm. Did Melissa McCarthy get one for Bridesmaids? Yeah, wow, wow, then I, I guess it's on the radar. I don't see it happening simply because it is so hard to get an Oscar nomination for doing a comedy because and the Academy, just, mm -hmm. they just don't respect it that much. I mean, Melissa McCarthy, I would put Tiffany Haddish's performance in Girls Trip on that level. And that is, that, that, that's that's high praise. I mean, I also brought up Katherine Hahn in Bad Moms last year. Tiffany Haddish steals that entire movie and everybody's really funny in the flick, but Tiffany Haddish just gets it to another level. It's like when you see somebody on screen for the very first time, whether it's Jim Carrey and Ace Ventura or it's Eddie Murphy in Saturday Night Live, and it's like, this person is something special and we're gonna be hearing from them for a long time to come. Has anybody seen Girls Trip here beside? You saw Girls Trip. <laughs> did you see Girls Trip while you were in New Orleans? I did indeed. Did, did you try the swing thing? I did not. It wasn't going while I was there. I think it might be seasonal, maybe perhaps only during Mardi Gras. But uh, I actually really enjoyed that film. Uh, it was a little slow going for me at first, but I would 100% agree that Tiffany Haddish's performance is, is on par with Melissa McCarthy's and Bridesmaids. And as a matter of fact, as of now, um, at the number of days since its release, um, Girl Ship has made more money than Bridesmaids mm -hmm. had done at the same point wow. in its cycle. So that's kind of interesting as well. Tiffany Haddish carried that movie. There's such a thing as a scene stealer. She is a film stealer. Yeah. I think the other leads had a moment or two where they were able to be great and able to shine and be very funny. Tiffany Haddish was hilarious front to back. There is absolutely no way she is getting an Oscar nomination. <laughs> I mean, it would be such a great thing to see. I just don't think it's going to happen no for way. no other reason, Christian, than it is so hard to get comedies recognized. And like I said, and raunchy ones, um, raunchy R-rated comedies are hard to get noticed. Stranger things have happened. Um, I mean, look, the other day we were talking about how Robert Downey Jr. was nominated for Tropic Thunder. Um, so it's possible. I tend to agree with you guys that it probably won't happen, but... Here's to hope. That's Although right. I haven't seen it yet, so I want to see it first, and then I'll say here's to hope. Well, also, it's like if the season ended today, who would be in the playoffs? You know, like if the <laughs> if the movie year ended right now, I think she's got a pretty good shot. But can we have all these Oscar movies coming up? Do you see any way that we could get a, a comedic performance like Tiffany's nominated for an Oscar again? I wish because. We all, as, as comedians, and, and you're damn funny, like we know it's harder to be funny sometimes than to cry. Um, but at that, the, I'm good at both. <laughs> <laughs> so is Christian. Um, but um, five minutes before the show started. <laughs> yeah, the, the Academy is, 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 even with some recent changes, it's still the Academy of Motion Picture Arts mm -hmm. and Sciences. Uh, and occasionally they'll let someone funny in, but it's, it's just not But to happen. be fair with that argument, though, to be yeah. fair with that, people still don't realize the way that it works in the Academy is that the way that people 
people get nominated inside of those categories are their peers are nominating them. So actors and actresses sure. can, it's not just the snooty old white men and white women up there going, oh, you I, know. I agree uh, with that. So there, it, there are the comedians out there that get a chance to vote that should vote for her. But so I they usually think, don't wake up in time. I still right? think you get that ballot in your mailbox and you're like, Oh, it has the Academy on it. I better, I better. <laughs> <laughs> That's that might be yeah. true. I want to impress the rest of everyone. Yes, yes. That's true. But I just a lot of people always think that it's just like these seven people just you know sure no, like, that are that right. are voting and it, it is the peers of each said category. So yeah, it's one guy from Price Waterhouse Coopers and he's the one giving the envelope to yeah. Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty <laughs> and that's why the Oscars was fixed last year. Right. All right. Let's move on to our next False. Twitter question. All right. This one comes from Jake Sova, who writes, Will Ron Howard open the gates to more established directors making Star Wars movies? Ooh, that's a good question. Christian, you're chomping at the bit. Yes, I, because I think that is, uh, we talked about it on, on Jedi Council. I, I do. I think that it was a great move and a ballsy move for Kathleen Kennedy to take chances on people like Gareth Edwards, Josh Trank, Ryan Johnson, um, you know, the, uh, Lord and Miller. With the exception of one that I mentioned, they have not worked out. Um, now I'm not saying that's not it could be Lucas's film's fault, absolutely, but it's not working out. So whether or not I actually think they should keep taking more chances and just find the right people, but I think because of this, they're going to be gun shy. I think that they're going to now you're going to see more people, established directors, name directors like Ron Howard. You're going to the next. Although I wouldn't be surprised if they already kind of lock someone in for the Obi Wan movie when that happens. So after that, I bet you that that path will start, you're going to start seeing bigger directors. Yeah, but it could be a double-edged sword because if you get a more established director, sometimes they come in with their clout and their weight. And like you're not going to tell Christopher Nolan how to direct his movie. And so they're going to do whatever yeah. they want to do. I think yeah. that the perfect marriage was somebody like Ryan Johnson who happened to come in and they had a good meeting, they had a good storyline, and they just seemed very happy with everything that guy did. But he's the gold standard because he's the one. Right. So what it looks like, the two differences, you, you set up someone like Gareth Edwards and, um, and you know, Lord and Miller. The dip, because Ryan Johnson, for what we've known, there haven't really been any problems. It's just been kind of great, like a dream scenario. The, the Edwards and Lord Miller scenarios are very similar. The difference is that when they said, hey, we're going to bring in Tony Gilroy to help you out, Gareth Edwards, he was like, all right, I'll play ball. I play ball. What, what should I do next? As for Lord Miller, like, nope, we want to do this our way. We're, we're out of here. They were out of there, and then they had to make it public. So I think that you're right. If you can find someone like Ryan Johnson to everything go great, I'm sure that's what they're looking for. It just hasn't happened. Yeah, T, I'm going to make you the head of Lucasfilm for a little bit. Congratulations on your promotion. What do you think the next move is going to be for your studio and your company? Do you go after more established directors that you can maybe breathe a sigh of relief with? Or do you continue to take risks on more unknown talents? Uh, I think uh, I, I'm going to have to disagree with Christian on this one. I don't think this is necessarily the end of these sort of mid-tier directors taking on these big franchises. And I think I've made this analogy on the show before. I feel like this is the studio giving you the key, giving the keys to the valet to park their car. They're not giving you the car. <laughs> and I don't think that they're going to be able to maintain the sort of creative control and brand consistency that they would if they let Mel Gibson, Quentin Tarantino, these big name directors come in and take over these franchises. I think they might be able to do that on occasion if they find a good mix, a good chemistry with whatever the particular franchise is and what the director is. But I think at the end of the day, Lucasfilm, Marvel, all of these studios, this is their shit. And oh, I'm not saying I'm not control. saying Marvel. I'm yeah. specifically saying Star uh, Wars because Marvel. I agree. Marvel. Marvel's been working. Yeah. You look at like Ryan Coogler did Creed, but from everything we're hearing with Black Panther, that's working fine. Mm -hmm. They've got a different structure over there. Whatever mm -hmm. Kevin Feige knows. Kind of, I'm not talking DC. I'm not talking Marvel. I'm talking Star Wars specifically right now. The problems that Kathleen Kennedy has been having, I just think she's gonna. You're gonna see more big name directors. I don't disagree with your point that the depending on who the big director is, you've got to be careful because right. you want to set to that specific story that they want to tell. And the director goes, well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. That was always the big problem. But I think they're going to find people inside of... She's been around for a very long time. Even have mm -hmm. watching E.T. with my daughter the other day and mm -hmm. produced by Kathleen Kennedy. Right. And I'm like, she's, she's got a lot of connections, a lot of big people. They're like, 
please tell my story the way I want to do it, that it might happen. I agree, Marvel and DC, that's not changing. Yeah, Ken, with, with Lucasfilm, I mean, you, you want to think it's just going to be a case-by-case -case basis where it's like, oh, we're going to interview these people and make the best decision. It could be something where Disney is a big studio. They have a lot of tentacles there, so you could have films be proving grounds to see how you would do a Star Wars film. Like, Ava DuVernay is doing A Wrinkle in Time right now. If that works out well, you could see Lucasfilm being like, we like what you did there, now let's do something like this. How would you vet the process? First of all, when I was at Chili's last night, I gave the valet my card and said, take it, I don't want it. <laughs> that explains And he something. said no. That's why I still have that Camry with a hole in it. Um, but I... Uh, yeah, you know, your point's right about the overall picture, and I think your point to, to agree, it is the right person. Ron Howard is because little Ronnie Howard's been working with Kathleen Kennedy and Frank Marshall and George Lucas since, you know, he started this directing thing. So that was like, come in and calm it down. We talk again sports analogies. You fire the young, crazy coach who's 38, and he comes in and he goes 6 and 9, and then the, you bring in the, the veteran Wayne Fonts, comes in with his pants up Fonty. to here and a playbook, and he gets you to the last part of the season. Then you figure it out again. I think, Christian, you're right. They, there's something going on at Lucasfilm specifically. Ryan Johnson, we know because, you know, we saw that guy in the airport. He's just the calm, taking pictures, just calm yeah. as can be, not a diva, nothing big. And, and, and these big films are businesses. Great analogy, though, all jokes aside, because it's like, here's the keys. We'll take it back in the big, back, uh, you know, at the end. Marvel's got it down. Talked about director Spider-Man. I, I, I know for a fact. He's like, hey, I, it's the less, least work I've had because every, I show up and everything's set up for me, and, and I get to have fun, get to create. So there's something going on. There's some kind of communication. Maybe it's just aberrations. They got the wrong people. We don't know. We're assuming. Everyone's kind of against Trevorrow for reasons outside of the actual movie yet. Um, we'll see what's going on there. But, yeah, I think it could be a mix. Because, yeah, you're right. You get, you get Mel Gibson in, and he's like, I've got some ideas. Mel, please. Uh, that's, <laughs> we're not, no. Um, or or like Wes Anderson directing yeah, that stuff. Yeah, and like, I love Wes Anderson. I don't see that one happening. Like, do, 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 do. <laughs> like, no, it's not going to work. So it, it, it should be case by case. Sometimes in this business, it's not. And established directors aren't always just Tarantino, right, you know, right, right, Wes right. Anderson. It, like, uh, Matthew Vaughn is an established director, yeah, a guy yeah. like that. Uh, Brad Bird, well, no, he's not established yet. I mean, they established an he's animation. An it's, animation. It's, it's, Tomorrowland was a stink. Yeah, it's also what you could do with these big... You mentioned, like, Ava DuVernay, like, handling Ava Wrinkle Duvernay. in Time. Yes. Boom! She's up here. Mm -hmm. We love her because down here and then and she's doing this and this and this, but that's a business. That's yes. a multi-million dollar business you're running for six months right. or two years of your life doing the whole film start to finish. You get past that and all, all these big corporations, because their corporations are going to go, yes, we like handing you the keys. That's just how it works sometimes. And you, you get the young kid... The young NFL coach, I was an assistant in college and I've got some plays. Now you got to run a team of, of, of uh, for an NFL billion dollar owner and it doesn't work out. Well, let's make that, that coach analogy a quarterback analogy instead. Would you say Jay Cutler is the Ron Howard of the Miami Dolphins? Okay, look, I'll tell you what. As a Miami Dolphin fan, I don't know what's going on this week. We got a retired uh, school teacher coming to be our quarterback. I, 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 I don't know what's going on. Starring Jay Cutler as Scott he and, he and Adam Gase were friends. Like, what do you want? All right. I want $10 million to do nothing. All right. That is going to do it for us here today on Collider Movie Talk. Thank you all so much for joining. Make sure you leave a comment in the comment section. Thanks to our cool, hardworking, and very excited about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers staff back there. And also the panelists up here with me, Ken Knapsack. Where can the kids find you? Hey, you can find me at Ken Knapsack across all social media platforms, including Peach. Remember that was up for a week? I have it. Find me on Peach. It's like two years old. <laughs> I have two friends on it. What the hell is that? T, do you have a Peach account that everybody can check you out at? I have never even heard of that. I'll show you after the show. Uh, but you can find me over on Cinefix, which is right here on YouTube. And uh, you can also find me on my personal YouTube channel, which is called Nappy Headed Jojoba, for tips on caring for your Afro textured hair. The host of Jedi Council, Mr. Christian George Harla. I don't know what was more intriguing, the fact that you brought up that Peach thing or watching Mova kind of scroll through her head and realize if she had an account or not. <laughs> no, uh, I was like, what is Peach? I'll and show you guys that show. I'm not wow, making I'm it up. I'm curious. Really? Anyway. You continue to be weird, and I love you for it. Uh, you can find me at Christian Harla, Twitter and Instagram. A lot of Schmodown stuff happening. Obviously, Mark mentioned the Inner Geekdom match today. And then on Friday, it's the team title match between the Patriots, Jeff Snyder, JTE, defending the titles against Moda. Doc, the former team known as Rotten Tomatoes, Gray, Drake, and Matt Ashney. Modoc, that sounds like a bad guy in the A team. You know, he was like a comic book character. All right, well, yeah. I wasn't that far off. Ashley Bova, where can the kids find you when you're not on Peach? <laughs> you guys Playing can football. find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. Happy Tuesday, indeed. And Wendy Lee Zaney. 
Oh, I actually downloaded Peach and then deleted about an, an hour serious? later. So you will not find me on Peach, but you can find me at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. <laughs> I am merely Mark Ellis. You guys can follow me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. I'll be at the Laugh Factory tomorrow night, Wednesday night, the Comedy Store this weekend. And we'll see you guys right here tomorrow for a new episode of Collider Movie Talk. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.